Jerusalem was and remained the capital of the Israelites and later the kingdom of Judea until its final destruction by the Romans in 135 AD. It is the one and only capital and spiritual center of the Israelites and the Jews for almost 1,000 years. Even during the centuries leading to the Arab conquest of the city, Jerusalem remained the singular and most persistent spiritual focus of the Jews and their hope to return from their exile to the land of their birth. I would like to point out to those followers of Muhammad who may be listening that the name of Jerusalem is mentioned 667 times in the Hebrew Bible, while there exists not a single mention of it in the whole of the Quran. The same Bible that the Quran uses as a witness to its own veracity and alleged divine origin. Also, while the followers of Muhammad keep repeating ad nauseum the mantra that it is their third holiest city, they deliberately, willfully and with utter contempt to history, religion and reality ignore the fact that it is the first, foremost and only holy city for the Jews whose capital it has always been. They also deliberately and very conveniently disregard and overlook the fact that it was the Arabian hordes of followers of Muhammad who occupied the city and took it away from the Christian Byzantines when they conquered their land and subjugated its native peoples. The followers of Muhammad, the aggressors, have the goal and audacity to claim the city, which is holy to Jews and Christians, as holy to them also, just because Muhammad allegedly had a one-night stand there. We now arrive to the most glaring historical and theological deception in this myth that can possibly be imagined. It is extremely important to point out that in the days of Muhammad there was no Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem since it had already been destroyed 550 years earlier, 70 AD, by the Romans. In the days of Muhammad, the Temple precinct, the Mount, had a church on it. Muhammad and his later followers created the myth to associate the newly established belief system with solid foundations, both religious and historical, so that it gives itself continuity and legitimacy. In the days of Muhammad, Jerusalem was called Elia, in deference to the name given to it after its destruction by Hadrian, who built the Temple of Jupiter over the ruins of the Jewish Second Temple and renamed the city Elia Capitolina. Muhammad's description of the temple is as imaginary, as deceptive, and as untrue as any mirage in the Arabian desert. Sahih Muslim Hadith 328, narrated by Abu Huraira. The Messenger of Allah said, The Quraysh were asking me about my night journey. I was asked about things pertaining to Bayt al-Maqdis, which I could not preserve in my mind. I was very much vexed, so vexed as I had never been before. Then Allah raised it, Bayt al-Maqdis, before my eyes. I looked towards it and gave them the information about whatever they questioned me. Muhammad, the alleged greatest of all the prophets, who had just returned from his glorious and incredible night journey to the non-existent Temple of Solomon, forgot what it looked like and needed the usual very convenient and miraculous reminders from Allah. Ibn Sa'd, Kitab al-Tabaqat al-Kabir, Volume 1, page 248. I stood at Al-Hijr visualized Bayt al-Maqdis and described its signs. Some of them said, how many doors are there in that mosque? I had not counted them, so I began to look at it and counted them one by one and gave them information concerning them. Muhammad was definitely lying when he described a structure that did not exist. So much for the truthful messenger of Allah. Ibn Ishaq informs us with great honesty on the authority of Muhammad's premier wife, Aisha, that his body never left her side and that he was only transported spiritually. This is corroborated by the Qarawiyun Library Manuscript in Fez, Morocco, where it repeats that Aisha, the Prophet's wife and most intimate companion of his later years, declared emphatically that he was transported in his spirit, biruhihi, while his body did not leave its place. Further, the great Al-Hassan al-Basri, who belonged to the next generation, held uncompromisingly to the same view. In another version, section 267, page 184, it is Hind, Umhani, daughter of Abu Talib, Muhammad's cousin and sister of Ali, that relates concerning the night journey. The apostle went on no night journey except while he was with me in the house. He slept that night in my house. He prayed the final night prayer 
and he slept, and we slept there. Whom should we believe? His companions who were not with him, or his wives and household females who slept with him? The modern followers of Muhammad, in their usual attempt to eradicate the histories of their conquered peoples, are now claiming, as well as asserting, that there never was a Temple of Solomon. One of those who spread this obscene lie was the unlamented Yasser Arafat. Dear listeners, I have mentioned on several occasions that it is by divine justice that the very hadiths that explain the Qur'an to the followers of Muhammad are the same that utterly destroy its alleged divine origins. The same is true about the followers of Muhammad who attempt to deform and contort history and reality to conform to their perverted agenda of delegitimizing and or dehumanizing the Christians and Jews and their links to Jerusalem. Let us assume for an instance that Yasser Arafat and others like-minded Muhammadans are correct, that there never was a Temple of Solomon. Then these unholy idiots and morons destroy the veracity of every hadith that are the second most important legacy of Muhammad since they contain his sunnah. Ladies and gentlemen, so-called believers and unbelievers, every chapter of our series destroys verse by verse, mantra by mantra, term by term, idea by idea, the alleged veracity and or the divine origins of the Qur'an and the hadith. And we are enormously beholden and indebted to the followers of Muhammad and their supporters for helping us accomplish our mission.